environment uh, well and, uh, the topic really is you know we're starting on the auto ethnography and as I understand it it's what kind of culture have we built so we're talking about in open online experience what kind of culture have we built either within the open online experience or, or what are we going to bring to someone else now that we've spent this 10 months learning together so um, we've been talking about for the last couple of minutes before we started recording we've been talking about how really unions uh, and teaching professionals need to converse with their districts and, and really start negotiating not just money but start negotiating time and professional development uh, in the in the school where how do you find time to do that and and not wait for that professional development day or, or wait for the district to give you something but to go out and build your own professional development and how that may be something you negotiate with uh, cutting down the amount of hours we teach so we're not teaching eight hours a day but we have a little time to, to spend on that professional self so and I if someone was going to say something please go ahead well, Brendan, I was, I had mentioned earlier that I, I've been planning an ed camp since the fall and, and this Saturday at Camp Island on Manitoulin Islands in Ontario is going to happen. It's the first ever. And one of the things I think that um, certainly I, I can't speak for everybody, but certainly I, I, I think I underestimate is people's reticence, their shyness, their, you know, their interest in, in, in an unconference event, but their, their concern about, about showing up. I, I happen to have a conversation with one of my colleagues who today said to me, you know, oh, you know, I think that event would be so good to attend to. I think it'd be so interesting to go to something like that. And, you know, I had, to, I had to pause for a second and think to myself, well, just go. So, but what I said out loud was, so you're, you know, you're feeling kind of shy to go? And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, I am. And I said, but you know what, there's, there's so few of us, and you know most of the people. And it, it's really nothing to be concerned about, you know, so I try to, you know, without being heavy handed about it, I try to, you know, mitigate her fears or her concerns. Um, I don't think she'll come, but it makes me think how many of the people didn't even have the, the courage to say, I think it's, I think it's a great idea. I wish, I wish I could go. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, so it's it's a bit you know it was brought home to me today again and maybe just in a slightly different way than other times, but it was brought home to me today that this this is a big thing for some people, so probably for many people. I think you're, you've got a point that um, it is scary for people to, to come and, and be a participant. But again, that's the that's the culture of, of education that we've been in, that, that teachers are uh, not participants and not leaders. They're just go in the classroom, shut the door, and, and teach. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hoping that we are playing a small part in, in changing that culture, in, in making more teacher leaders. Um, and encouraging people. Well, you know what, I, I think we I think we are. I mean, certainly, you know, it, it, it's always interesting to run. Uh, well, it, maybe it's not always interesting, but for me, it is now interesting to run sort of these little data pictures, you know, um, about 
who's doing what and why. So I, I brought in about, uh, I don't know, something around 22 participants into OE, but certainly my star performer is Heather. Um, she's in the same jurisdiction as I am. She doesn't work for the same school board, but she's in the same geography. She's on my um, ed camp planning team and she will be at ed camp. So, um, uh, on Saturday, so this is, this is, um, you know, that, that's fantastic. In one case, it worked really well. You know, she, she got involved and, and she's expanded, you know, she's, she participates in the BYOD chat and she participates all over the place. She's got her, her own PLM, her, obviously her, her, her own community. And so I think, you know, it, it does, it does have an impact. I just think we have to, you know, have perseverance and go at it, you know, to continue and, and continue going at it. Jeanette? Yes, hello. Yes, hello. Hi, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? Hi, how are you? I'm great. So what do you think about um, this idea of encouraging teachers to get involved in the professional learning that's available online through something like OE? What's your experience been like? Um, I think I think it's a great idea. I also think it will help teachers become more professional. Um, I, I'm hearing I'm getting feedback. So should I let me see? Do I lower my my volume? Is that better? I'm not getting any feedback at all, Jeanette. So it's on your okay. end. Okay. Okay. Um, I think it will help teachers become more professional. Uh, I think one of the things I've noticed is that sometimes teachers, unless their professional development is mandated, the last they, they there's not necessarily a initiative to professionalize, and therefore. Teachers may not always be at the forefront of um, and of uh, changes that happen in education because they're not they're not paying attention always to the debates and and uh, and you see that really with technology a lot of ed tech one of the things I've noticed a lot of ed tech companies you have all these people with technology backgrounds designing programs and apps for uh, for teaching for the classroom space, and they don't actually know how teachers how teachers teach. Like they don't know the business of teaching. Uh, so I just I think that uh, OE, OOE and um, and online professional development are great tools, and we should encourage more teachers to to do things like that. Thanks, Jeanette. Hey, um, so were, did you feel you were a connected educator before you uh, started with Open Online Experience? Um, well, I, I didn't know. As I work in independent, for an independent school, so um, I don't think there are readily available connections in the way that in, if you work for a public school, like uh, so, I think I made a lot of connections through 
participating in the Twitter chat. And for me, I use Twitter as a personal learning network. So I learned a lot from Twitter and I learned a lot from this program and it's already impacted what I do in my classes. That's great to hear, thank you. Um, so what do you think you guys will be doing in the future to, to carry on or how will this impact the professional development choices you make in the future? I think it's important for, for, uh, to always continue professional development. Um, as much money as your school or district will give you towards professional development, one should, <laughs> one should use it to its max. And if there are free professional development opportunities, you should still, you should go, yeah. And that's how I, I view it. I, I view it like I owe it to my my profession as a teacher. I owe it to myself. I owe it to my students to to participate in professional development. Jory, you're not a an old grizzled veteran yet. You're not <laughs> stuck in your ways, but still learning. And I think sometimes that's um, it's um, I, I I make a little light of it, but um, you know, sometimes uh, it, it is seen that way as, as the young people are always go-getters and, and working really hard and, and when, we, when we get older and we have kids and we want to spend more time at home and less time doing these professional development activities, but I think we can still fit a lot of them in. It's just when we when we um, make it a priority in our life, you find times for things that you that you value that are important. Um, so I find time for professional development, I guess. Well, you know, the thing is, is that we have um, in in every in every field you have people who, who reach, you know, people who have a, an understanding about the job that they're doing and who it's impacting, the difference it can make. And um, then you have, you know, other people who, you know, not to say they don't do a good job, I'm, I'm not saying that at all, but um, who believe they have been trained for the job and that the, that the professional development that they receive from the organization they work for is sufficient. Um, and so, you know, that's the challenge, I think, is to, you know, how do we overcome that? How do we shift that, that way of doing things that's, that's fairly entrenched? Um, in the culture of, of many, many professions and to say, no, um, given the way things are today, we're co-learners, I have to, you know. I mean, today in our staff meeting, I had to laugh because um, my colleague talked about learning how to say, I don't know, to her students. And because I knew she was going to do that, she was going to have this conversation about learning how to say, I don't know. I played the, a little video clip, I don't know if you've seen it, by Patrick Green um, from Pea Green Soup. And he has a small video on YouTube called The Shoulder Shrug. You know, so many students ask you questions. How long should this essay be? How long should this paper be? You just, you know, shrug your shoulders and say, I, what do you think? <laughs> um, it, was, it was a little bit of levity. We had a little bit of fun with it. Um, but that's the thing. You know, how, how do we get people to be, you know, to release that responsibility and to be um, 
to allow the students to take some lead and to be co-learners. That's a huge shift. It is a huge and very difficult shift for most people. Um, you know, we grew up, the teacher knew stuff, and, and, and yeah, uh, yeah. how do you say the teacher doesn't know anything? And, and, and it's, <laughs> but it's, it's also, you know, I can see a parallel in, um, in, in the machoism or, or the manly stuff, you know, um, you hear a lot of people talk about, you know, a real man wears pink or shows his feelings and, and, and yada, yada, yada. But, uh, you know, if you're a man in our regular Western culture and you uh, show these traditionally female or effeminate traits, you know, it is hard because you don't get support for that all the time. So if you see the parallel in teaching, if you're a teacher who says, I don't know, why don't you figure that out? Uh, you get a lot of blowback from that. Um, a lot of our teachers this year, you know, they've been saying to the students, the students ask these silly questions and they'll say, you have a Chromebook, look it up. And the students, and the, when we surveyed the students, one of their big complaints was, they're not teaching us anymore. They're telling us to look it up on Google. So, you know, it's very hard to change that culture um, because you're forcing everybody else to change too. So, you know. I just love hearing that, Brendan. I love it because when my students tell me that technology should never replace a teacher, they're right and they're wrong. Um, at the same time, but it's it's so great to think about between Manitoulin Island and and um, and you that the the answers are the same, right? The the, the, the sentiment from the kids is the same. That's fantastic. Um, it's not fantastic, but it's just it's reassuring in some way, right? That um, this is the response. Yeah. Mm. Um, should, I, I think. It, go ahead, Jeanette. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Julie. Julie was speaking. No, I, I was just going to say that um, that the culture is uh, slow to move, I think, in part, too, because it's not, I don't think that it's being validated. Um, it, you know, there's a lot of times where the press is very negative about social media and about about the change in education. I mean, look at what's going on in math. I, I don't know if it's happening everywhere, but there's serious pushback against math and discovery, discovery learning or problem-based learning, inquiry learning in math. And um, this push to back to the basics is always, you know, it, it, it causes people to stop and, and um, wonder what they're doing and it gives you know, empowers empowers the, the traditionalists. So, you know, it's um, it, there's a lot of facets to it. There's a lot of tentacles going on. Um, I think when <clears throat> I think when Brendan to to go back to something that you said earlier, when students say, "Well, the teachers are no longer teaching," if they like, if they say, "You have Chromebooks, look it up," I think that um that we're at a moment where we can differentiate between different types of questions. So before, when dictionaries and encyclopedias weren't readily accessible, a teacher had to know um, a lot of, just a lot of information, a lot of random facts, just in case a student was going to ask this, this random question that might be related or may not be related to the to the topic, but now we're in a moment where, where the teacher does not need to, to know the response to questions that are Googleable, and the teacher can then focus on, um, on other types of questions and other types of, of learning, and um, and maybe helping students make that shift. 
you know, to like, hey, that's something you can look up. You should look it up. Like, that's not something we need to spend. Uh, you don't need me to explain that to you. You can look it up and explain it to your classmates. Yes. Um, so helping students also make that shift away from help them become more self-directed in terms of showing more initiative in their learning. Yeah, it's funny. There's um, when I was in high school, it was uh, like 20 years ago. I do remember that, uh, you know, we all complain that, uh, in like history class, why do we have to memorize all these dates? And and you know, those progressive teachers were not putting dates for events on on the on the tests. Rather, you were supposed to understand. <clears throat> what went on during that. And um, and while today in history we're not really going back to memorizing dates, there are a lot of um, web-based timeline tools so that the dates start uh, becoming more important. And, um, and I think that's a good thing because, you know, it really starts putting a context into this when you can see when you can relate the date with the the uprising or, or, or whatnot, the sentiment, and then you can compare them, you know, around the countries around the world. I think that really starts bringing history more alive, and it gets to what the historians really meant when uh, they said you need to the the factual dates are not important, but uh, what was going on during that time is important. Uh, so, you know, we can't focus only on hard facts. We have to also have to focus on feelings and in, in, in uh, the culture of the time. But now, now with technology, you can actually bring both of those together a lot easier, and uh, the meaning and the relationship between what was happening in the U.S. and the you know, time period and in Europe in the time period and in Asia, you can start seeing those things uh, connect more uh, easily. So, you know, I don't know what my point was because I got so lost in trying to make it. <laughs> that, that happens to us often out, out here <laughs> on, these, on these sessions. Um, I think. You know, we, we try to, we're, we're, we're thinking out loud, you know, and this, I remember um, Will Richardson once, one time I read something that he said, and he said, you know, okay, this is, this is thin thinking. And, and I remember it was the first time I heard that expression, and I like using it because, you know, often when I work online, you know, I'm presented with ideas that maybe I didn't think about in in that way, and I, or they were, they were brand new to me. And so, you know, Brendan, I think we, sometimes we, we either immerse ourselves in ideas or we sort of stretch ourselves into thin thinking and that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Cause you know, we have to, we're trying to figure stuff out as we go. Um, and it's, there's no guideposts, you know, there, there really aren't. I think that um, every day we, uh, every day we go up against questions and scenarios that uh, we're not quite sure we have the answers for and with our teachers, with our administrators, with our students and we're just trying to, you know, figure stuff out the best we can. I, I told my grade 10 class today that, um, because we're, you know, they're struggling. This is a class that is very much in line with much of what we said today and tonight, which is, you know, they want to use technology, but they want to use technology for their own entertainment. They don't, they don't see it as being part of their learning. And so it's a bit of a struggle, uh, but it's a convincing act. And, and yet, they're not really enamored with print either. So they're really nowhere. And so today, after some months of teaching them, I realized, you know what, I, I need to 
I need to talk to him about this. And so I said, you know what, you guys, this this is the way it is whether you like it or not. We have one foot in the print world. That means that you have to, I think I think you still need to know how to write an essay. I still think you need to know how to write a research report. I think you still need to know how to function and deal with print. But I also think you have one foot in the digital world. And, and you need to know how to create a digital story. And you need, you need to know how to, to, to navigate around digital text. I think, you know, it was the same for me when I was raised. Because in Canada, uh, a long time ago, <laughs> we moved from imperial to metric. And I was a teenager when that happened. And so, you know, I had one foot in the imperial world. And, measurement world and I had one foot in the metric world and you know I survived <laughs> and I figured out those systems <laughs> along the way so I said then you know the, the people who are 10 years younger than you they, they're not going to deal with the print world in the way that you are but you do need to do this because when you go to post-secondary you know you're still going to run into professors and and teachers at college who are going to ask you to Write an essay. They're not going to say, "Give me, you know, voice thread. Give me a digital product." I mean, they might, but they might not. They may say, "Give me an essay, all paper, word process." And you, you need to have some of those, you need some of those skills. And so, it this is hard. This is really hard work. And at some level, all of this ability to um, uh, communicate has a, a, a commonality somewhere in the base. You know, it's all whether you're trying to uh, persuade someone or inform someone or whatnot, there's still those bases. And uh, I think sometimes the, the choice of the medium uh, becomes as important uh, as the medium itself, as, as the message itself. And uh, students don't understand that sometimes. They're, they think that uh, just because paper and pencil is, um, is old school, that it's not as powerful as, uh, as a movie or a picture or a tweet. But uh, sometimes it's more powerful. For sure, but I, I think that, you know, I can't think that, I can't believe that we're the only jurisdiction that has kids who who are caught in the conundrum that sounds like this, that says, on the one hand, I think schooling is out of a textbook. I think schooling, being learning is a worksheet, that I read something, I do some work, I answer some questions, and I'm done. On the other hand, they're not engaged by it. But if you give them something that engages them, they say, that's great, that's fun, that was engaging, but that's not real learning. And yeah. so that's the spot that the kids are caught in. Yes, I see that spot a lot. Because I don't... I come in and I, I teach a, a class for a week, maybe, with students, and it, and it's a fun thing, and, and it rarely gets graded. So when I'm in with the classroom, <clears throat> they don't feel like they're learning. Mm -hmm. um, and, and sometimes that leads to the kids. You know, we were in freshman seminar asking students to do uh, public service announcements for internet safety. Uh, and uh, we did our little intro for two days, and then they were supposed to work on it over the next couple of weeks. And, and a couple of the groups were like, we're not doing it. <laughs> we're not getting uh -huh. a grade, so why should we bother doing it? Uh, so then they had to grade everybody, and yeah. they ruined it for everybody. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, and, and even when it's graded, 
they may they may not see it as valuable as they may not see a digital product or digital text or digital work as meaningful or as important as, as something that they, in a traditional sense, whatever that means, whether that's textbook work or, or worksheet or what have you. Um, the assessment for learning piece, that, that piece that demands practice, that demands effort, that demands re repetition, is just you know, very undervalued and, and potentially always has been. I mean, you know, high school is a pretty dim memory for me. So, you know, potentially that's always been the case where kids just never have wanted to do anything more than once. Um, but I think then, and I guess for me, what I'm, I'm learning about is that for this, these particular kids, and wherever they are right in the moment, whether they're in grade six or eight or 10 or 12, they're in this moment where both there's an expectation that you can handle print text and you can handle digital text, both with ease, both with fluency. And that's just not true. But I think that expectation is going to stay there because oh, I agree. We're, yeah. not, we're not losing print text, we're adding digital text on top of it and they're going to be expected to learn more. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, I remember my my school days and I was the worst student in the world because I I was smart and picked things up really quickly and I'm an excellent test taker so I was great in school and I never had to study up until you know college and um, and so that threw me for a loop so I went skating through high school, basically not paying attention to anything and not caring about my grade and, and realizing that a big reason I actually graduated was because I don't think they wanted me back there anymore. Um, but they couldn't, you know, they weren't going to get me to drop out, so it was less passion. But, you know, and then you get to college and um, that's why that that blog post I, I of the guy who um, did the two MOOCs, uh, it really struck me. He did the, um, um, the biology course at MIT, which is as a MOOC, and he was spending 15 hours a week on this. Uh, and I'm like, you know, I've never actually done that in a class in my entire life. Uh, so, but this is the thing that our students are not getting in, in school, is that um, there's actual work that you have to put in. It's, and it's not that it has to be boring or, or worksheets or anything like that. It's the fact that you have to get yourself engaged in something and, and put some, some time and some effort into it if you really want to create a, a product and, and learn something. And, uh, I don't think we're getting that message across to our students. We're getting a message across of fill in the bubbles and you'll be done. You know, actually, Brendan, I had a, I've had students, I, I conference with students. Well, I'm, I'm sure I conference with everybody at least once a week. And um, those great chats, they, they're pretty articulate about um, they don't come to school to think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, of course, my response is you're going to learn because, you know, you're not going to get past me if you don't think. You've got to think. You've got yeah. to make decisions. Um, but, but to this, to this juncture, to this point in their academic lives, They've been able to, you know, get by doing whatever is asked of them, and uh, and I think that's the point. I think the kids. I really do think the kids are fine. I don't think the kids are really substantially any different than when I was a teenager, or when I was a kid, or when you were. I just I think that 
you know, we don't think that they can think that we're not getting them to do the work they need to do, the thinking and the decisions they need to make um, from, you know, whatever, grade four or three and working that up. Um, yep. Yeah, that's what I think. And so by the time you get to high school, now your kids are a bit, are a bit younger than mine. My youngest is going to be turning 21 in June. Um, mm-hmm. my, you know, we know when when we raise kids that if you don't deal with problems when they're little, they're they're not going to be any better when they're teenagers. <laughs> the problems only grow, and and they get harder to deal with. Uh, and I think that's obviously that's true in the school system, and it's obviously true in learning. So if we're not you know, if we're not doing, and I've told, I've told elementary school teachers, primary teachers that, you know, I really do think it, in many respects, they need to be paid more than everybody else. Um, if they do a really great job, all of our jobs are better. Mm-hmm. Start them strong in, in, in the early years and they're all set. I, you know, I think it's right around second or third grade, the um, seven and eight year olds, that they start realizing that if they tell the teacher they don't know how to do it, then the teacher reteaches it, and they don't actually check, you know. And that's where what, what, it starts, right? What grade did you say that was? Uh, around second or third grade. Yeah, I agree. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I had a student in grade. I have a student in grade ten who told me um, in a metacognitive assignment that through a series of questions that he had to answer, he told me that he's in grade 10, but he said, I don't think I've learned anything since I was in grade five or six. And, you know, the one thing I have to say about this group of grade 10s that I have is they are right, they are so, <clears throat> they're so honest, they're so uh, real, and I think they have it right on the money. I don't, I will I don't dispute what this boy says. I don't think he's learned anything since grade six either. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and as sad as that is, I think that's true. I think it's true for lots of our kids. They're just, they're just saying it. And, and we're telling them to say it, right? Yep. yep. Just repeat what I say and, and fill in the right answer and, and you have it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and, and he's smart enough to know that that's not learning. <laughs> right. Yes. But 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 by grade ten, he's lost all the he's lost the natural kind of curiosity that he would have had. I mean, he's so he's yeah. smart enough. Like he's got the synopsis, right? He's got the ability to articulate. I haven't learned since grade six. But sadly, in the process, he's lost a lot. And 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 now as a high school. How do we, we've got two and a half years to, to do something, to do something about it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Tough time. So, you know, and you think about it, there's, there's not a whole lot that he really needs to learn between grade six and grade 10. There's uh, maybe a little <laughs> bit about algebra, but it, it, I mean, well, the concept of algebra are even calculus are understandable by kids as young as five. I, I'm working with the, there's a professor, a math professor in North Carolina. She runs some MOOCs and she teaches, you know, math and calculus to, to five year olds. Uh, so they can, you can really understand the concepts. So all of this beating people to death with find the value of X in middle school, uh, is really all it really does is teach kids how to hate math which they probably learned in third grade when they were forced to memorize the multiplication table and and spit that back as fast as they can so you know in third grade you've got multiplication down you got some division down though people don't do it too well Um, you learn how to read to learn as opposed to 
re learning to read, and, and you've got some basic paragraph down. So third, fourth, fifth grade, you've got that stuff kind of down pretty well. What else do you learn new until you get to calculus in high school or physics in high school? So, you know, by that time, you're, you're bored <laughs> and you don't yeah, know how just, to learn and you don't want to. Yeah. No. And you've, you've forgotten what it is to be curious. Yes. You know, like, I'm not saying forgotten permanently, but it's just been shrouded. It's just, you know, it's, it it's comes back diminished. when you're in your late yeah, 20s or I, early 30s. I, um... <laughs> yes. hmm. You're us. <laughs> yeah, potentially. You know what? I, this is the thing I love about these conversations the most. I love how similar our circumstances are and our jurisdictions are so far apart. I just can't, I can't, um, I can't be thankful, more thankful for that than I am. You know, like it's just fantastic. I appreciate you sharing everything tonight, Brendan. It has been a joy, and I'm glad you're here <laughs> just to talk to. I was afraid I was going to be alone. So thank you for coming. Oh, it's always good That's to talk to you. To yeah. Perfect. So, Have a great night. Great. Thanks. You too. And uh, we'll see you soon. Yeah. Thank you. Bye.